Okay, Daniel, go ahead. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Good evening, good afternoon, uh, companions, brothers. Um, I appreciate that introduction. I uh, don't want to spend too much time talking about myself, but uh, I do just want to let you know that uh, I've been studying masonry pretty much since I joined. I've been a really avid researcher. I have really enjoyed and found quite a bit of information. Um, and I'm, I'm one of those people that really likes to quantify data. So a lot of what you're going to hear about from me today is things where I said, where is this fact? Where is this proof? Where is this information? Um, so as you go through this with me, I, I would welcome you at the end to ask questions. I absolutely love to talk about uh, the research I've done and, and some of the places I've found the information that I consider proof of, of the facts that have been have, we've claimed for years in masonry. But uh, You'll, you'll see that what I really love to do is quantify things. And I'll start this off with one of the favorite things that I've done in masonry is actually just looking at Masonic temples and, and the, the historical aspects of what we have in our, um, in our various rites of masonry. And so I love to talk to people and find out information about how big is your temple? How long has it existed? You know, what has it been used for? And, the history of some of our buildings are just absolutely fascinating to me. And I've, I've always thought it'd be really interesting to write a book on just the, the temples, Masonic temples that we used to have that we've lost. And I, you know, a lot of what you see online is people posting information about, gosh, look at this empty you know, shrine temple. Look at this empty Scottish Rite building. Look at this empty Blue Lodge and what a beautiful historical um, uh, memento it is. And so, as we go through some of these things, um, I, I, I've only been a Mason for a little over a, a, a decade, about a decade and a half. And uh, so I, I haven't been able to personally experience some of this. So a lot of what I've been doing is living vicariously through the facts and, and research and history that I've read. Um, so I, I hope you'll share this excitement with me as I share with you some of the things I found in cryptic masonry, which I think are absolutely fascinating. So the first thing I want to start off with, and I apologize for this absolutely horrible photo taken um, in the early 1900s, um, I want to share with you something that's kind of bragging rights for my jurisdiction. This is Oklahoma's cryptic masonry temple. Now, this was built on a hill, and they named it Mount Moriah. Um, the, the building you see on the left there is actually a two-story cryptic uh, masonry building. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And the building down in the bottom right is the dining hall. And this was actually built solely for the purpose of the cryptic degrees. And our jurisdiction uh, was actually built in McAllister, Oklahoma. And one of our councils built it. And our jurisdiction at the time, which was about 1920, 1917, it was completed, and it really got active in 1920, our jurisdiction actually said any council in the state of Oklahoma can confer the degrees in this building. Basically, they gave them um, statewide conferral rights, which was unusual at that time for our state, because this was such a crown jewel in our uh, state's history, Masonic history. So a little bit about the, the building. It was built in 1906, or excuse me, 1908 to 1914. And the, the probably the most interesting fact is, is that in 1920, only 4% of all residents in Oklahoma had electricity. But our building, what they called the crypt, had its own independent power plant. So it was actually designed cutting edge for the, for the time period and designed to really be a successful building. They had talked about things like putting in tennis courts and a child playground area, and they had huge plans for this and made a huge investment to build it. Um, the building that was on the left-hand side that is actually the temple area was 30 feet by 90 feet. And as I mentioned, it was two stories tall. But the fascinating thing, which I think cryptic masons will really enjoy, is this quote from one of the news reports on the building is that beneath the altar, on the upper floor of the building, beginning at the last series of the nine arches, is another subterranean passage leading to the south and descending in a series of three, five, and seven steps toward 
the second or lower building. There was actually a 95 foot underground subterranean passage connecting the main hall, which is that big Masonic building on the left, to the dining hall. And I just think that's absolutely beautiful and amazing. So I start that off with something that from my, from my home uh, jurisdiction here, because I think it's really exciting and it's something that's really proud of. Um, they obviously tore this down. The, the depression was, was hard on this. And actually just a few years later, we built a huge Scottish Rite building in the same city. And that was actually downtown. It's, it's still used today. And it's, uh, it's, it really is, it's on the highest hill in the city of McAllister. And it's, it's popularity for this building actually has been one of the reasons that this building fell into disarray or disuse is because it's everyone was downtown and in, in the busy city. And this was a this was just built far enough out of the city that it was outside um, the normal travel area. So it was a journey to get to. And we had a lot of problems keeping it up because vandals would go in um, because we couldn't have have someone there at all times. And they would go in and try to collect artifacts for themselves from our from our building that wasn't being uh, maintained on a regular basis. So this is the crown jewel of my jurisdiction as far as cryptic masonry goes, but I, I want to share with you some things that I think are even more amazing. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have had the chance to visit Pikes Peak, but you may or may not know that we actually have cryptic masons have a time capsule built into a rock at the very top of Pikes Peak. Now, if you know this fact, you're probably a, a pretty good study in cryptic masonry, and, and, and that wouldn't surprise me if you know this. But the thing that's most interesting about it is the history of this little triangle that's built into the rock. So in August of 1899, we made our original deposit into that rock that was shown there, and they placed a metallic uh, triangular plate on the top of it. Well, some I like to call them ruffians in the summer of 1959 actually went up to the top of Pikes Peak and pried that triangular plate off of our time capsule and took it, removed it from the mountain. Now, the, the cryptic uh, masons of Kansas, the, the Grand Lodge of Kansas are actually the brothers that do this, and they have it in their um, constitution code or the regulations to go and visit the deposit every year and inspect it. And so they very quickly discovered that that triangular plate had been removed. And there was numerous reports from the press. Uh, there were police investigations. They went and visited all of the pawn shops in the area, hoping maybe someone had just taken it to a pawn shop and tried to exchange it for you know, some cash. But the fascinating fact of this whole mystery is that just two years later, the triangular plate was actually found against the rocks on the top of Pikes Peak. And a concessions employee found it and placed it inside the concessions office, um, unbeknownst to the Grand Council of Kansas. The next year, one of the representatives of, of the most illustrious Grand Master of Kansas actually made the annual journey to go inspect the deposit and happened to go into the concession stand and say, you know, we've been missing this triangular piece that was atop of our time capsule. <laughs> the, 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 the concessions employee reaches underneath the counter and pulls out the, the triangular plate that had been missing for three years. Now they replaced that plate on top of, back on top of the um, time capsule that year. And then of course, in a hundred years later in 1999, the deposit was opened. And the most fascinating fact that I think very few Masons are aware of is they actually melted down the original plate and created a new triangular plate for the second deposit, the second time capsule, which they replenished in 1999. And if you see there on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a, a jewel that's um, uh, most illustrious Jerry, uh, was a Stolheimer of Kansas has sent me they actually created a jewel for the 10 living most illustrious grandmasters of Kansas that includes pieces of the metal from that original triangular plate. So it is not only, not only has it been recovered 
and uh, now re restored to its location with a new plate for the next hundred years. But it's actually being a part of it is actually being carried around, literally on the hearts of our grand masters, um, most illustrious grand masters of Kansas. So I just think that's a great story of something that's been kind of a you know a dramatic, exciting thing for us in cryptic masons, but still has a very happy ending. The second mystery I have for you, and uh, General Grandmaster, sir, I know you would never do this, but uh, in the thirty-fourth uh, Triennial Assembly, the the Grand Council of Cryptic Masons has a report that. Uh, a Grand Master's duties were not actually fulfilled. And I know that's unusual for a Grand Master to say he didn't do something right. But I think this is absolutely fascinating. They, as, as you may or may not know, and we'll go into this in the very next slide, we had a centennial deposit, another 100 year old time capsule uh, presented by Grand Master Cooley at our fifth assembly. And it was to be opened at the 100 year anniversary of cryptic, of cryptic Masons International, or, or Cryptic Masonry as we know it, um, as an organized body. And so the general Grand Master that year said, I'm sorry, but I couldn't complete this duty as I had been assigned nearly 100 years before. So if we take a look at the, um, at the proceedings, they have this beautiful picture of an iron chest with a bronze tablet that was presented in August 21st, 1894. And if you love to read proceedings, I really encourage you to go into it. There is actually a key to this box, which was transferred from the Grand Master to his eldest living son under very strict conditions. He had to be a Mason. He had to be a, a good and upright man. It was very well defined. And, and if any, in any case, this was found not to be the case, that key was to be transmitted to the general grand master of cryptic masonry and then returned back to his eldest son or eldest uh, descendant, should he be a, a good and true mason. So take a look at that. You'll, you'll find this in the fifth uh, annual uh, proceedings. It's very, very, it's a very fun read. But again, just like our Pikes Peak deposit, they were required uh, the most puissant general grand master of the general grand council or his designee was required at each triennial to inspect this deposit, which for quite some time was at the Grand Lodge of New York, and give a report in the proceedings. And this was based on a resolution adopted in 1894. Now, you're asking, well, Daniel, this is a very formal uh, requirement. Now, how in the world will the Grand Master, General Grand Master, possibly miss out on this opportunity to be a part of a, a century of history? Well, here's the catch. The Grand Council of Royal and Select Masters of Washington in 1928 also made a deposit that they wanted to be opened on the 100 year anniversary of cryptic masonry. And so they made their deposit. And of course, cryptic masons will know that they made it at exactly nine at night. And this was August 25th, 1928. They deposited a vacuum sealed glass tube encased in a copper cylinder in the base of the flagpole of the Washington Masonic home. And this is actually the photo of the deposit being made in 1928. And, and you can see it's totally dark outside. So it's, it's nine o'clock at night where, where all the good Masons are. And so they, the general Grand Master had been contacted by the Grand Council of Washington and his attendance had been requested on the 100 year anniversary to, to, make, that, to make that discovery with them, to open that um, time capsule in that flagpole, in, flagpole base in Washington. And he committed to that. And so they had this beautiful coin uh, token struck, which you see here on the left-hand side. And they, they, the, the general Grand Master committed to, his, uh, uh, to attend. And as a result, he couldn't open the actual cryptic general Grand Council's um, cryptic vault at that time. Now, again, if you love to read proceedings, you can 
head dive deep into the proceedings and see the whole story of, of how that centennial chest was opened and what, what was done with all the materials. It's, it's just a fascinating read. But as you can see, um, again, the triangular plate, which served to cover the capsule in the flagpole base, is now on display at the Grand Lodge of Washington Library and Museum in University Place, Washington. And uh, Monty, sir, I know you will be long out of office at this time, but according to the notes that are in uh, the General Grand Council's proceedings, they actually made a new deposit and committed uh, the 150 year anniversary, which is coming up in nine short years, 2030, they'll be opening another uh, deposit in, in, Washington, in the state of Washington. So again, another time capsule with a great story and an interesting incident, but all's well that ends well. Everything has been opened, discovered, and, and most importantly, nothing was lost. But now I'd like to share with you what I think is probably the most fascinating mystery I've ever uncovered. This is the daily diary of President Gerald Ford. And the date, and I apologize if this is too small, I know some brothers are on mobile phones, the date is January 11th, 1977. And it says at 11.50 a.m., the president participated in a ceremony to receive the degrees of Freemasonry. And there's additional text beyond that. Now, obviously, this is the daily diary of our sitting president, Ford. And those of you that know or are even slightly familiar with his Masonic history, I've got a little timeline for you here. And you can see, even if it's very small on your screen, he was actually initiated September, 90, uh, September of 1949. He was made a fellow craft and a master mason in 1952, but this diary entry is 1977. So it's obviously not possible, unless there was some major Masonic error created, made, that he received the degrees of masonry in 20, eight years after being initiated into Freemasonry. But the fascinating part of this comes from when you read further. It says he received the degrees of Freemasonry from members of the Grand Chapter of Royal Archmasons and the Grand Council of Royal and Select Masters of the District of Columbia. And there's even a list of attendees placed in the appendix of, of, of the president's diary, and you can see who was actually there. So the fascinating story is when you go back to the proceedings of the General Grand Council, and it says it was, with, it was a great honor for me to be invited to go with officers from the District of Columbia to the Oval Office of the White House for the conferral of the Royal Arch and Royal and Select Master degrees on the President of the United States, Gerald F. Ford on January 11th, 1977. Without a doubt, this was a very high point in my three years. The reception and greeting by President Ford will be long remembered. Now, brother and I, I know we talk a lot about making a mason on site and all the, all the intricacies of that, and I don't want to get into that type of discussion. But the fascinating fact is, if you look at the time in, 11.50 a.m., and the time out, 12.24 p.m., the President of the United States in the Oval Office of the White House was made a, a, a Royal Arch Mason and a Cryptic Mason in exactly 34 minutes. I don't know if we have any other event that is as amazing for Cryptic Masons as that, but literally he had, if, here's my timeline again, he, was, uh, he had nine days left in the Oval Office, and he chose, in my opinion, to make Masonic history for us. Now, I know a lot of us are York Rite Masons with all three bodies, and I'll, the biggest question I ever get is, well, did anybody make him a Knight Templar? I haven't been able to find out uh, any dates of his degrees for Templary, and obviously the biggest thing I always hear is, well, Daniel, you, you, it's tougher to make a Knight Templar on site there's a, there's a grand encampment. There's all kinds of, of, of different ordinances about that. But, uh, you know, I think we would uh, be, be very uh, 
proud of that fact if it, if we had if he had chosen to join Templary. So I I can't imagine that we wouldn't have that information placed anywhere else. But this is something I chased down because a lot of people have said, you know, President Ford was made York Wright Mason while in the White House. And I didn't realize how literal that fact is. He was actually made a, a Royal Arch and Cryptic Mason in the Oval Office. And we have proof of that in his diary, complete with the list of, of the officers that were there to, to confer the degrees. So with that, companions and brethren, um, I'm, I'm open to questions and uh, my email address is on the screen. If you wanna contact me afterwards, please feel free. But uh, General Grandmaster, sir, I'll turn this back over to you.